So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our great panelists tonight and i um, like to introduce now our moderator, uh, 350 NYC member extraordinaire, Clara Vondrich. Clara is a trained attorney with a diverse background in law and policy, science and foreign affairs. She's currently the director for climate and energy at Fenton Communications, which leads client efforts on a range of campaigns, including the divestment and investment movement, defending and promoting climate science, carbon pricing, and the clean energy transition. So take it away, Clara. Thank you so much, Lena. I really appreciate that warm welcome and introduction. Um, I have to tell you all that being a member of 350 NYC is one of the most uh, special experiences that I have today. When we're faced with the urgency of the climate crisis, it can feel so overwhelming. And yet, being a member of 350 gives me a sense of agency, like I have something I can contribute, so that sense of hopelessness falls away. We are truly lucky to be here with this amazing panel. Um, we have not only some of the most esteemed um, global leaders that are engaged in the UNFCCC process, but we also have a climate activist and labor leader, um, and we also have an amazing young woman human rights attorney who will tell you about how she's working to keep big corporations out of the climate treaty making process. If anyone has been observing the global climate treaty talks for 25 years now, they probably feel a sense of hopelessness. In 1992, the world's leaders came together and decided that we needed to do something because human-caused climate change caused by greenhouse gases was imperiling the Earth. That was in 1992. It's 2015, and precious little has changed. Every year, the warnings grow more dire. Every year, there's a new study, a new scientific panel explaining that we have precious little time. I'm not sure how many of you saw this, but last year, 2014, became known as the first year that we became, we had proof positive that the West Antarctic ice sheet um, was melting beyond repair. Just last week, there was a new study that shows that the East Antarctic ice shelf may also be melting beyond repair. Together, those two land-based bodies of ice will contribute 21 feet of global sea level rise. Now that's not going to happen in our lifetimes, but it will happen in our children's and grandchildren's lifetimes. So at this point, before you know, these leaders gather in Paris in December of this year, many have held it out as the last best hope for a global climate treaty. Um, some of the early indicators are, are positive. Um, Europe has pledged to reduce global emissions or its own emissions 40% um, by 2030 vis-a-vis -vis a 1990 baseline. Our President Obama has signaled that he intends to commit about 26 to 28 percent reductions by 2025 vis-a-vis -vis 2005 levels. These are great, these are numbers, um, but the problem is many countries are putting out, the process is very complicated as you all understand, but we are now in a stage where everyone is expected to put forth what are called, not independent, intended nationally, nationally determined commitments. Intended nationally determined commitments. And each country is to put those forward in March of this year and, and up till the Paris talks. And hopefully, we'll all you know, just cross our fingers, those will add up to the level of commitment that we need to retain a two degree, uh, no more than two degree warming. And yet, what these policymakers aren't paying enough attention to is the fact that we have a finite global carbon budget. I don't have to tell all of you that carbon dioxide is a long-lived gas that persists in the atmosphere for centuries. The amount of carbon we put out today will be there not only next year, but 100 years, years from now. Therefore, it's not important how much each country reduces emissions annually. What matters is the ultimate net carbon budget that we're all trying to stay within. Therefore, when each country comes together with its INDC, we have to pressure them to make sure that their contributions collectively add up to a level that will keep us on the two-degree path. 
I'm really interested in hearing from our leaders here today about their ideas about whether that seems possible based on the level amb of ambition that has been introduced so far. Um, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but from what I understand from observers, the pledges on the table today are not going to be enough. And so we hope that the levels of ambition will increase, and it's up to us as citizens to continue to pressure our policymakers so that that ambition continues to ratchet up. So before I go on too much on my soapbox, I'd really like to kick off our panel. We may have to do a little bit of um, engineering of the schedule because Helen Rosenthal, who is our um, city council member extraordinaire, has not yet arrived. And we also just learned that our um, minister, uh, uh, Jeffrey Wahid, will have to leave at 8 o'clock. So we're going to try to go through the panel and open it up for Q&A. Um, but just bear with us to be a little flexible in case we have to make some last minute changes to the program. So it first gives me great pleasure to announce Sean Sweeney. He's the director of the recently launched international program on climate, on labor, climate, and the environment at the Murphy Institute, City University of New York. He also coordinates trade unions for energy democracy, which is a global network of 36 unions from 14 countries. TUED advocates for democratic control and social ownership of energy resources, infrastructure, and options. It's probably no surprise to you here that the labor movement has traditionally been a force against which climate activists have had to battle. Um, jobs across the fossil fuel industries are really important. Transitioning coal country to sustainable jobs is a huge priority. Sean has stood at the forefront trying to explain how we can align those interests, transitioning to a clean energy economy, keeping those jobs safe for union members, and helping them understand that there is a better way. Uh, Sean Sweeney, do you mind coming up? Thank you. I've been told I have 10 minutes, so I'm afraid I have to skip the thank yous, but thank you everybody for putting this event together. Um, um, Labour's role in the talks and what needs to be done, these are obviously the broad questions we're confronted with um, inside the Labour movement. And I want to start off with uh, an expression that popped in my head earlier today when I was preparing these comments, and that is that Labour is in a bracket. I want to come back to why that is in a moment. Um, Labour, in terms of the talks, were inside for a 10 or a dozen years, not in big numbers, but they were there, mostly Europeans, um, not really mass engagement of the movement um, internationally to start with. Then for a year or so in 2013 to the end of 2014, it was outside, it walked out of the talks, and now it's kind of inside and outside. It was back in, in Lima, and it'll be there in Paris. Now, the general approach of the labor movement, and I'm referring to the international labor movement, the US labor movement is something of an outlier, and I'll try to say a word or two about that if there's time. But the main position of the, of the labor movement is uh, framed by the International Trade Union Confederation, a body of 170 national federations representing something like 190 million workers. Uh, mostly in uh, the OECD countries, but also in the Global South. Unions support the IPCC scenario, the science-based targets. They supported them back in Bali uh, in, uh, in 2007 for COP13. Unions are almost totally united on the need for a legally binding agreement. They were opposed to the Copenhagen Accord and the voluntary commitments approach. So I've got that off my chest. Now, the AFL-CIO is the domestic labor movement and critically important because of their relationship to the Department of State. And up until now, only a few unions, largely in the heavy industry and carbon intensive sectors, uh, fossil fuels essentially, have been writing the script for the labor movement. This is beginning to change as unions in public transport, in healthcare, are moving into the climate debate and advocating for climate justice solutions that are internationalist in their approach, but more important, are based on the science. So there's a struggle going on inside US labor, but in the international labor scene, there is 
uh, broad support for a legally binding agreement that really tackles the problem. So that's the first point. At the, um, but the question was raised, is the negotiating text and the so-called um, national uh, commitments, actually I believe the word now is contributions, not commitments, so it's intended nationally determined contributions. So even there you see a softening of the language from commitments to contributions. This has really been the dominant uh, tone in my view since the Copenhagen talks five plus years ago when the Obama administration and a number of other countries said we don't really need a global agreement, it's not going to happen anyway, and in order to really tackle emissions we've got to get a few major players and we should talk about what we can do and not what we have to do. So that was the main tone of Todd Stern and others uh, in, the, uh, in the Obama administration. But, you know, the point has been made already, I don't, by Clara, that these commitments are not going to get us to two degrees, they're certainly not going to get us to one and a half degrees. And when UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, talks about the emissions gap report, it's all well monitored. We're talking about three, four, five degrees of Celsius of global warming, uh, even though these commitments may sound good on paper, the Obama administration is going to come out, we believe, with its commitment. We've seen the EU's commitment, which is far more uh, ambitious than probably a lot of the others are likely to be. But I just want to quote from um, a comrade of mine, Pablo Salon, who said, no single country has challenged this suicidal path by putting in the negotiating text that we need a global target to reduce global emissions to only 40 gigatons of CO2 equivalent by 2025 to avoid an increase in the temperature of 4 to 8 degrees Celsius. And that means 80% of the fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. None of that language is in the text and is probably not likely to be in the text, but we need to be clear what's missing even as we give sort of half a, or one thumb up to the commitments or contributions that have been declared. The um, approach to the U.S. is probably can be summed up in the phrase, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We've heard this, it's a very compelling line. But I think a less poetic line should be, don't let the scientific reality get in the way of business as usual, because I think that's really what's intended in some of this language. And what I see in the text, and we've seen it now for a number of years, is kicking the ball further down the road so that somebody else is going to be able to have to deal with the problem of getting it out from underneath the car. Um, the 2021, what's that all about? We're supposed to be decarbonized. Carbon intensity is supposed to be being reduced by the rate of 6% a year, according to a study by PricewaterhouseCooper. And yet we're saying, oh, look, let's start in 2021. The EU has made a qualifier there saying, well, if 80% of emissions can be covered under a new deal, we should start immediately. That's commendable. But the main point is there won't be that level of commitment. I'm sorry, the phone's ringing. Now, back to Labour. Labour then is not getting the agreement it wants in Paris, it seems, and the world is not getting the agreement it needs. There's a big point uh, for the labor movement. There's a big push at this point to get some reference even to workers and work in the final agreement. The, um, they want a reference to just transition and decent work, which is presently in the text for now. It wasn't there in Lima. It got it in in Geneva. So I said at the start that labor is in a bracket and it reads like this. We're in a bracket of one of the 1,200 or so brackets in the text. So that everybody's got a bracket. And at the moment, all those tens and hundreds of millions of workers add up to a bracket in this agreement or this proposed text. And it says this, all parties should consider in their climate policies and actions a just transition of the workforce that creates decent work and quality jobs. Who can argue with that? Well, there's plenty of government leaders who can argue with that and have been arguing with that for a number of years now. Now, there was a high point in Labour's participation in the talks, and that was uh, when they talk started talking about the green transition, green jobs, in order to counter the Great Recession and the unemployment. And they took 
confidence from the stimulus packages around the world. I don't have time to deal with that, it's not necessary. But Labour walked out of the talks in, in uh, November 2013 in Warsaw because it was too dominated by corporations and some of the government negotiators were sitting with their feet up on the table as, um, as other delegates gave speeches about the impact of climate change on their communities. This was the disrespect shown to countries like um, you know, the, um, the smaller nations and also those who have been hit their hardest from this. So Labour has now an inside and an outside strategy. And this is where I want to spend the last couple of minutes of my talk uh, discussing. Because Labour marched in New York and they marched in Lima. The Labour movement, including the miners, where there was a very impressive march in Lima at the last COP. But the choice, if the choice is impotence on the inside, because that feels terrible, versus impotence on the outside, which feels a little bit better because you're among friends, then it still amounts to the same, that we're not really wielding the kind of power or influence that is necessary. So being outside must mean more than just organizing a demonstration. We had 400,000 people in New York. There'll be other demonstrations. We need to be outside the narrative of the market. We need to be outside the confines of hopeless realism that surround the talks. We don't want to be a movement that are the enablers of inaction by loudly applauding the small steps whether we're outside or inside, if we're having that approach, it won't be sufficient. And so we have to talk as a movement and all social movements, all activists who are concerned about saving the planet and future generations have to talk in terms of a need for a new approach. In labor, we call it a programmatic shift, one that's independent of the corporations and also to some extent independent of the mainstream environmental groups that tend to disregard the interests of workers to some extent. It needs to be science-based, no compromise on the science. It needs to be internationalist, we're all in this together and we need internationalist solutions. And it needs to be transformative, small measures will not be enough. But most important of all perhaps, it has to engage the ordinary working women and men around the world to put the interests of workers and the interests of planet on an equal footing so that the, those who um, oppose the planet and, and destroy the planet also destroy the lives of workers need to be identified. Now, some rays of hope. In my view, it's not insignificant. I mean, to me, it's very important, I should say, that the talks are going to take place in Paris. As an old socialist, when I think of Paris, I think of the Paris Commune of 1871 or so. I think of France 1968. And more recently, I think of how the French trade unions against the domination of business in Europe fought off the increase in the working week, defended five weeks paid vacation, stopped the hiring of young people at lower wages for the same pay. If we can engage the French unions in a way that says it's now time to stop work for the climate. A march is not enough. We need to work with our social allies and tell the world that there is no other way except to say this is not enough and it is business as usual is unacceptable. The, however, it's no good just demanding political will. We have seen for 20 years a lack of political will of astonishing levels. Labour and the social movements, the environmental movement, need a programme for action that can inspire people but also deal with the question of climate change and emissions. And that means, and I quote here Maria van den Hooven, the head of the International Energy Agency, revolutionary changes in the methods of production and consumption in the world. And if she can draw that conclusion, then the environmental and the labour movement can do the same. We need to get out of the bracket. We are not a bracket in a negotiating text. We are the people, the movement, and we have to go to our strength, which is ordinary working people, men and women all around the world. Thank you. Twelve minutes. Thank you so much, Sean. That was really moving. And thank you so much for reminding us of the, uh, the gap um, between what the science requires and the path that we're on. I'd like to actually call out um, 
a young woman, Laura Segafredo, who's here in the audience today. She actually um, was a co-author on the United Nations Environment Program Emissions Gap Report. And um, you should feel free to talk with her afterwards to uh, learn more. Next, um, I'd like to introduce, um, actually, yes, I think that's a great idea, given the timing. We'll do a little switcheroo. Um, so Sean also mentioned uh, this idea that the poorest among us are going to be the hardest hit by climate impacts. And we have someone here who is representing perhaps those nations that will be the absolutely hardest hit. Um, and I'm speaking, of course, of, of the small, small island nations. We have here tonight Jeffrey Salim Wahid, who is the deputy chair of the Alliance for Small Island States. And he is um, also a minister, deputy minister to uh, uh, of the Mal to the Maldives, of the Maldives to the United Nations. Um, he is, um, his responsibilities here in New York include overseeing the diplomatic, consular, and administrative work of the mission. And um, he's also, uh, since September 2013, he served as the deputy permanent representative of the Republic of the Maldives to the United Nations. Uh, we're, we're very excited to hear his views on how the Maldives and the other small island nation states are going to approach the Paris negotiations. Um, as we all know, they have made heart-wrenching plea after plea at the negotiations before, and um, to date, most of those have been passed off by the industrialized countries as, as not sufficient and not moving enough. So I'd like to hear his views on what we can expect uh, the industrialized, industrialized world to um, to say to the small island nations whose very existence is imperiled. I give you Jeffrey Salim Wahid. Yes, please. Thank you, Clara. Thank you for that introduction. Let me say what a privilege it is to be here at this event um, and apologize that I have to leave early. Being from a small country and a small mission, um, we wear many hats and we have a lot of commitments. So I do apologize for having to leave early. Um, as you said, my name is Jeffrey Wahiz. I'm the Deputy Permanent Representative here in New York. And along with my ambassador, Ahmed Sarir, who's currently in Lima, we oversee our work in the United Nations across a wide array of issues. <clears throat> from social issues, from human rights, from this UN Security Council to UN reform, and of course sustainable development and environmental issues. But let me begin by telling you a little bit about the Maldives. The Maldives is an archipelago in the Indian Ocean made up of, of 1,192 islands, 300 of which are home to small island communities and single island resorts that have made the Maldives such a popular tourist destination. That's how most people know the Maldives. But a large percentage of our population, about 100,000 of 135, sorry, 100,000 people out of 350, live on our capital, Male. It's one of the most densely populated cities. And in addition to that, we also have the distinction of being one of the lowest lying island nations in the world, with our highest point less than three meters above sea level. As you heard in the introduction, since the beginning of this year, the Maldives has been the chair of the Alliance of Small Island Countries, AOSIS. We are a coalition of 44 low-lying island and coastal nations from the world's ocean oceanic regions. Although membership of AOSIS is diverse, with countries from the Caribbean to the Pacific to the South China Sea, we have strong unifying attributes. All all of our countries, all of our members must contend, contend with the combined challenges of geographic isolation, small economies, and high exposure to extreme weather events. Let me give you a sense of how isolated we are. Even in an age of technology, in an age of state-of-the-art communications, the recent water crisis in the Maldives had our capital in peril. This past December, a fire in the island's only desalination plant knocked out fresh water supplies for 100,000 for all of our residents. Without natural fresh water supplies, we were unable to provide water for our people. And the reason why we didn't have a water lens is even in 2004, when we had 
an Indian Ocean tsunami, yes, it's not a product of climate change, but because of that tsunami, when the water washed over our island, it polluted our water lens so that it was, there was salt water intrusion as well as pollutants in our water, so we don't have fresh water supplies. It is only due to our closest neighbors, to our closest partners, people who reached out to us and sent water to us in a time of emergency that we were able to get the people of my capital through this crisis. But the anxiety is the same across the world. If you look at Pacific islands like Tuvalu, look like Nauru, like Kiribati, you see record droughts year after year. And this past week, you look at Cyclone Pam, which hit Vanuatu, which hit the Solomon Islands, which hit Kiribati, which hit Tuvalu. In Vanuatu alone, this cyclone wiped out 90% of the country's housing stock, and the death toll is still uncertain because communication to some remote islands is not yet possible. In addition to the seemingly more frequent one-off events, like our water crisis, like Cyclone Pam, the impacts of climate change is something that we have to contend with on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, Indian Ocean acidification caused by excessive carbon emissions is degrading our coral reefs, is affecting our fisheries, and we heavily which we heavily depend on for both food and income. I'm sure you've heard of some countries such as Tuvalu and Kiribati are now looking into moving their inhabitants to other nations buying surplus land for agriculture in the event that the seas are no longer held back. We in the Maldives have no plans to relocate to other nations, but we have been forced. We have been forced to move some of our com communities internally due to severe erosion and other damages, such as damage caused by the 2004 tsunami. Keep in mind that like other microstates, the Maldives' emissions are minuscule, just 0.0003% of global totals, yet we face an existential threat from climate change. And this underscores the salient point. We know that neither our country nor any vulnerable nation is capable of fully addressing the climate change crisis unless we work together and depend, and their true action on this issue depends on others as well. Now with that background, let me give you some information about the current UN negotiations on climate change. Now I must confront up front that I don't follow the climate change negotiations as closely as many of my colleagues do, but I can give you a broad perspective of where we are and where we're trying to go. In 2011, even recently, the nations of the world agreed that we should come up with a global agreement on climate change by this December, December this year, at the meeting in Paris. And the agreement is mandated to go into effect in 2020. Now the problem with this is that that leaves an ambition gap between the commitments that have only been made up until this year, an ambition gap between this year and 2020. So what EOSIS has done, what EOSIS has done in previous chairs, as, and with the Maldives support, has been to put a program in place to address mitigation action in the pre-2020 period. We're well aware that action is needed before 2020 to avoid locking in high emitting infrastructure, infrastructure such as coal power plants. We have been meeting since 2011 to discuss the shape of this new global agreement. One of the features of it is that all countries will need to play their part in reducing emissions. In Geneva this February, we agreed to a draft negotiating text, mostly because we agreed to almost everything that people proposed. We have a document that's 90 pages long. It includes a lot of potential options, such as mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, support to developing countries to address climate change. But over the coming months, between now and Paris, what we need to do is we need to streamline this text. We need to find options and political agreement on issues that are extremely difficult, that are incredibly tricky. Now, among the main issues that we have to contend with is the issue of do we go up two degrees, do we go up 1.5 degrees? EOS's position right now is 1.5. The science on this issue, the science on climate change, it is clear. The science tells us that if the world warms by even 2%, which is our aim now, which is most of the world's aim now, the warming, a warming that may be reached within 20 to 30 years, it will cause widespread food shortages around the world, it will cause unprecedented heat waves, it will cause more intense cyclones like Cyclone Pam that we saw in the Pacific. 
we already have a 0.8 degree warming compared to pre-industrial levels. And we're on a trajectory, the way that we're going now, if nothing changes, we're on a trajectory for a four or five degree increase in global temperatures. Now this might not, this might not sound like much, but the reality is that this temperature difference is the difference between today's temperature and that of the last ice age. An ice age when most of Central Europe and, Northern, and the Northern United States was covered with miles and miles of ice. A magnitude of change, this time that will be human induced and will happen over the course of a century instead of a millennia. Over a hundred particularly vulnerable countries around the world, small islands, African countries, least developed nations. We're pushing for a stronger goal. We're pushing for a limit of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels because for many, for many island countries, anything above 1.5 will seal our fate as nations. Now another issue that is incredibly difficult for us to deal with is climate change negotiations that deal with financial support for climate change related actions, both to mitigate emissions and to adapt to the impacts of climate change from developed countries to developing countries. We agreed in the UN in 1992 that developed countries have an obligation to reduce emissions and to support developing countries given their historical responsibility for the current levels of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. I won't get into the history of everything that's happened, but as part of this commitment in 2009, it was agreed that developed countries will provide $100 billion a year, a year to developing countries to, conduct, to combat climate change. So we finally set up a new multilateral bank. We've set up a green climate fund to disperse these funds. Now, $1 billion, it may sound like a lot, but the scale of challenges, the scale of issues that we have to deal with is tremendous. A recent paper found that developed countries would need to give at least $400 billion a year, as much as $2 trillion a year, to cope with the demands of tackling climate change. And even this one agreed number of $100 billion is not without controversy. We negotiate about what, what con constitutes climate finance. We negotiate about whether these funds should be private or whether they should be public. And after years of negotiating the Green Climate Fund, it's finally operational. It's ready to receive funds, yet only so far $10 billion has been committed and these funds have been committed over years. Clearly the funding in place is grossly insufficient compared to what we need. Until developed countries are serious about climate finance, it will be difficult for us to find a way to reach a goal in Paris where emerging emitters such as India and even China feel compelled, sorry, feel compelled to take action. Now, we do need to recognize that countries who won't commit to promises they can't make, but we need to put incentives and support in place to help people make the changes they want to make, whether it's with renewables in New York City or, the, or renewables in the Maldives. We will need to do our part, and we have to understand that it is an incremental process. But little by little, we will make the change. And that being said, we need to ensure that civil society, that even organizations like 350, continue to keep up the pressure on governments to force governments to come to Paris with strong commitments that put their path in line with what the science tells us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. You know, you reminded us about uh, extreme weather, and I'm going to take the liberty of, of asking a question because I know you have to leave. Oh, and I see Helen Rosenthal has arrived. Welcome, Helen. Council member. You. you mentioned, for example, the devastation that was brought about um, by a tsunami, the Indian tsunami. And while you correctly pointed out it wasn't caused by climate change, we know that the rising sea levels are absolutely caused by climate change. And so when those tsunamis hit, when the cyclones do kick up those waters, 
the event, the, the consequences are that much greater because of climate change. So I think from a messaging perspective, given that I work in communications, at every turn you should emphasize the fact that that sea level is rising and that storm surge is creating the devastation and the havoc and the economic ruin when those kinds of maybe normal events take place. I learned recently that um, India's Prime Minister, Rajendra Modi, has committed to assist the alliance of small island nations in some way in the lead up to Paris. Um, that was remarkable to me because India and China have both historically stood on the sidelines claiming that as not having contributed to the problem, they shouldn't be expected to deliver deep commitments. Um, though we saw last year um, in December in Lima that for the first time developing nations were stepping up because at the end of the day we all have to step up at this point. What do you make of uh, Modi's commitment? What does it mean? And um, what, what are you hoping for? Thank you, Clara. Mm -hmm. The reality is that when it comes to this instance, when it comes to this moment, we really do need all countries to come on board. It's no longer just an issue for developed countries, but for developing as well. And we've received both positive indications from China and India, but the reality is, is that developed countries need to show the kind... I can speak closer. Sorry. Thank you. So developed countries, need to be able to show leadership as well. Now, we look forward to India's leadership on renewables. We look forward to their leadership on cities. We're also excited to see that India will be more constructively engaged in the UNFCCC process. We're very happy by the pledges recently made by both the United States and the EU and China. Mm -hmm. And we're hopeful going forward. And I think that's one of the things that the Maldives was particularly noted for, even in Geneva that while we did have this incredibly difficult document, we had 90 pages that included everything under the sun, we still are hopeful because we're getting a lot of positive indications. And though this is our first year as the chair of the Alliance, leading the climate change movement is something that doesn't happen in leaps and bounds, but rather step by step. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that in the intercessionals, in the meetings between now and Paris, that we're able to get to a place where we have a streamlined document that actually meets the needs of small islands as well as all developing countries. Thank you. You mentioned also um, AOS's position that they think the upper limit for temperature rise should be 1.5 degrees Celsius and not 2 degrees as the, many other countries are advocating. Um, I also mentioned in the beginning that we now have pretty direct evidence that both the West and East Antarctic ice sheets are melting and will likely give rise to 21 feet of sea level rise. That's in process now and unlikely to be reversible given the temperature change you mentioned to date, which is only about one degree above pre-industrial nations. So in your view, is 1.5 degrees still relevant? The reality of what two degrees means for islands like the Maldives means that 1.5 as a target is always relevant. And though we're only at 0.8 degrees now, what we have to understand is that that's not where we are now. It takes 40, 30 to 40 years for the impacts of carbon in the atmosphere to even be felt by us. What we have now is not 0.8, though if you turned off all the lights in the world today, mm -hmm. if you turned off every generator, every power plant, the temperature would still rise over the course of the next 40 years. It's not something that we can change. We need to have as high an ambition as possible. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that no matter how far we go, even with 1.5 degrees, which is now looking less and less likely. Mm -hmm. Even with 1.5 degrees, there will be severe impacts across the globe. And when I talk, it's not just sea level rise. It's extreme weather events as well, tidal variations, cyclones. We've seen more extreme weather even here in New York than we have in the past 30 years. This is not something that will affect the low alone. It will affect the high, the north and the south. It will affect everyone equally. And what you get on the equator, Maldives, we're fortunate to be right on the equator. But what happens on the equator will affect the poles far greater. Sorry, that rhymed. 
<laughs> You're very poetic. <laughs> Thank you. You're a great cadence. Um, so, you know, one of the what I found was great poetic justice, actually, given that the U.S. has been the you know leading contributor to climate change um, from a historical perspective, is the fact that as the Antarctic ice sheets melt, um, because of the laws of gravity, there will be less of a pull of that ocean water to Antarctica, and therefore the water is going to slosh back and be higher in the United States than the rest of the world. So the northern hemisphere will actually suffer the most from that sea level rise. Um, so I'm going to ask you one last question, just because I want to make use of our time together. You mentioned that the highest point in the Maldives is three meters above sea level, and you also mentioned that you have no contingency plans to leave the islands. I recently um, had um, a great experience working with a climate justice attorney named Matt Pawa, who brought climate justice litigation on behalf of the Kivalina Eskimos in Alaska. And they, probably even more so than the people of the Maldives, have done nothing to contribute to climate change. They're essentially hunter-gatherers to this day. Um, and yet their small island nation is disappearing behind, underneath the waves, and they have to move. So I'm just curious, given how much sea level rise we have baked into the system, how is it that you have no plans to leave? Sorry, that sounds really harsh. We've explored the possibility of leaving. Clearly, countries like Kiribati, Tuvalu, are looking into leaving, into moving abroad, into buying land abroad. But the reality is, is that we have been in the Maldives for thousands and thousands of years. The Maldives is our culture, is our heritage, is our past, our present, and it has to be our future. Because once we leave the Maldives, we will lose our culture, we will lose our, our heritage, we will lose everything that makes a Maldivian a Maldivian. We will lose because we will be incorporated into whatever other culture there is. No matter how hard we try to maintain our traditions, we will not be able to. Everything that makes the Maldives a sovereign nation will disappear. And that's the reason why there is no other option. There's no way we can take land on another place and say that it's ours. Because the only way that we can survive is to actually survive, is to stay in our land, is to make sure that our islands don't disappear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Minister. We appreciate so much you being here today. And um, safe travels back to Washington. And thank you so much for all of your insights. Who in the audience has seen The Merchants of Doubt? Thank you. Yeah? Okay. Well, if you haven't seen it, go see it, please. It's a great film. Um, and our next speaker um, is going to share a little bit about the corrosive influence of corporations on our political process. And Merchants of Doubt is a great example, um, historical example of how that plays out. Um, as you all know, Big Tobacco fought for decades against common sense policies and regulations, and they succeeded. They convinced Americans that lucky strikes were good for you. Um, you may have seen some of the incredibly hilarious ads, hilarious and sad ads, of um, you know, the beautiful uh, young woman smoking and saying that luckies are good for her health. And that was because corporations sowed misinformation. They sowed misinformation in order to retain their stranglehold on power. And they continue to do that today in many areas, but perhaps none so pernicious as today in the climate fight. We can't afford to have any more misinformation. When we have a senator of the United States throw a snowball on the Senate floor as evidence that climate change isn't happening in the year 2015, you know we have serious issues. Our next speaker, Tamara Lawrence Samuel, is a human rights attorney who is waging war against the corporations. She's working hard to make sure that they stay out of the policymaking process vis-a-vis -vis climate change. She's the Associate Research Director of Corporate Accountability International. Corporate Accountability International has been around for 32 years, 37 years, um, and have been engaged in some of the frontline fights um, against keeping corporate power in check, including big tobacco. Um, and it's really come full circle now so that, you know, they're focusing on the, the next biggest public health emergency, which is climate change. Um, she is, um, she supports 
Corporate Accountability International's food, tobacco, and climate programs, driving strategic development of the campaigns. She is especially focused on implementation of the UN's framework convention on tobacco control and the application of its groundbreaking Article 5.3, which insulates the treaty from the power of corporations. Prior to joining Corporate Accountability International, Tamar held a visiting scholar appointment at Boston College Law School, where she developed a draft international treaty on the rights of deportees and was judicial affairs officer at the United Nations Stabilization Mission in Haiti. We look forward to hearing from you. just a little bit shorter than most. Um, well, thank you so much, Clara, for the introduction. I'm so pleased to be here and so honored to be speaking after um, Minister Wahid and, um, and Sean here. So I'll take a, a brief second to introduce the organization and then talk a little bit about the Global Tobacco Treaty and Article 5.3, which sets an amazing precedent and hopefully invigorate everyone and get everyone really, really excited about the solution to what we've identified as the biggest problem in this fight. Um, so as, as Clara mentioned, Corporate Accountability International is a member-powered organization that challenges the life-threatening abuses of three of the world's deadliest industries, tobacco, junk food, and the private water industry, the major obstacle to achieving the human right to water. A strategy that is common throughout our campaigns is challenging the interference of transnational corporations at the policy level, so challenging their political interference. And that is why we have launched an initiative on climate, because the fossil fuel energy industry sorry, is the biggest obstacle to achieving an equitable and effective climate agreement. So we will apply the international legal precedent set by the Global Tobacco Treaty to prevent the industry from interfering in climate policy at the UNFCCC, as well as the national level. If we want meaningful climate action, as we've heard already from our two previous speakers, a strong international framework that truly responds effectively to the climate crisis and spurs domestic policies, or bold domestic policies around the world, we must remove the proverbial fox from the hen house. The very oil, coal, and gas giants that have brought us to the brink of catastrophe are not just ne at the negotiating table. They are coming dangerously close to running the show. Examples of big energy's influence in the talks abound. From corporations actually sponsoring the talks to industry front groups like the World Coal Association gaining official observer status to solutions on the table that seek to enrich the private sector above all else. There are many routes for corporate influence over climate negotiations and policies. And I'm going to cite four examples, but I'm sure that among ourselves, we, in this very room, we can likely come up with several more. The first is direct lobbying. So direct lobbying can take place by way of national level industry lobbying expenditures and also through infiltration of government delegations to international treaty negotiating meetings. In terms of lobbying spending, in the US alone in 2014, oil and gas industry spent $145 million on lobbying. That same industry received well over $15 billion in federal subsidies. Direct lobbying also includes industry representatives joining official government delegations. At COP16 in Cancun, Shell representatives joined the Nigerian delegation. Shell representatives joined the Brazilian delegation at COP14 in Poland. These are just a few examples. The second route for corporate interference in these policy discussions is through industry associations. Industry lobby groups ask, acting as non-governmental organizations and obtaining official observer status as business interest NGOs or bingos. 
An example of such a bingo is the International Emissions Trading Association. And admitted constituencies like these bingos, all official observers, the status comes with privileges. You have access to the UNFCCC, you have access to documents, communications, delegates, meetings, workshops. You are given the opportunity to host exhibits and side events in collaboration with UN agencies. You can distribute documents, walk the halls, talk to people, and lobby. The third, the third route for corporate influence is um, industry events organized between official UNFCCC meetings that give transnational corporations the opportunity to interact, another opportunity to interact and network with UN agencies and officials on their own territory. And finally, partnerships, official UN and, corp UN and corporate partnerships that give the private sector input into UN policies that are geared towards profit expanding opportunities and market and and um, further access to policymakers. The UN Global Compact and its Caring for Climate or C4C initiative are perfect examples of these corporate driven, voluntary, self regulatory initiatives that are partnerships with the UN and that provide corporations with good PR cred and no enforcement mechanism because they're voluntary. The Global Compact is a compact of 10,000 corporations, and those include Coca-Cola, Petrobus, Shell, DuPont, need I say more? So that's the problem in a nutshell, but don't worry. There is an existing international law that provides a solution to this problem, and Clara mentioned it earlier. Most of you likely don't know about this, but I'm very excited to be able to tell you about it today. Big Tobacco, before Big Energy, sought and failed to undermine a similar international treaty-making process, the process of creating the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. The FCTC, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, provides an important and yet underutilized international legal precedent that can be applied to any industry whose profit motives establishes an irreconcilable conflict of interest with public policy aimed at regulating corporate abuses. The lesson learned from the Global Tobacco Treaty demonstrates the power and potential of, lead, of leaders standing up to behemoth industries. It testifies to the power of global grassroots organizing, and it demonstrates how effective an international treaty can be when it prioritizes the lives and well-being of people everywhere over the interests of transnational corporations. At the outset of the FCTC negotiations in the early 1990s, Big Tobacco was very well represented. It had powerful allies on important global North government delegations. During the negotiations, delegations representing and protecting the interests of, of Big Tobacco did everything in their power to weaken this agreement. The most powerful and vocal force no surprise, was the U.S. delegation acting under the Bush administration. The U.S. pulled out all the stops, the same way that the U.S. Represents, represented the interests of, the, of big tobacco in the FCTC negotiating process. It is representing those of big energy in the climate talks. But a strong contingent of civil society groups, including the Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals, also known as NAT, a South-North coalition that was co-founded by Corporate Accountability International, worked closely with steadfast delegates from countries where the industry was wrecking havoc to stand up to big tobacco. And so, despite tremendous industry pressure, governments of the Pacific Islands, of Southeast Asia, and of Africa together faced down big tobacco because they simply could not relinquish the opportunity to secure a powerful tool that would save millions of lives. When the treaty was unanimously adopted in 2003, it included the now legendary Article 5.3. This provision identifies the tobacco industry's fundamental and irreconcilable conflict of interest when it comes to public health policy. And it enshrines into international law the principle that the tobacco industry has no role whatsoever in public policy making. 
Article 5.3 states that parties shall act to protect their tobacco control policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry. This means policymakers should interact with the tobacco industry only and only when and to the extent strictly necessary, and I'm quoting, to regulate the industry and its products, and that in doing so, they should act transparently. In effect, what this does is it bans tobacco industry lobbying of public health policymakers, both at the national level and at the international level. The guidelines for implementation of this article of the treaty also prohibit access to the Conference of the Parties. They prohibit conflicts of interest in government. They prohibit partnerships with the industry, industry-sponsored events, corporate social responsibility, um, voluntary initiatives that take the place of legally enforceable measures. And Article 5.3 is working. Governments from the Philippines to the UK have used this international law to prevent the industry from having a seat at the table when crafting tobacco control policies. And as a result, Article 5.3 is helping to speed up the passage of tobacco control policies all around the world. And one such example is Australia's policy, um, plain packaging policy, which requires all tobacco products now to be sold without any branding. Today, the same arguments are being made to legitimize big energy as a stakeholder at the climate negotiations. But the reasons for protecting the talks from industry influence are also the same, and the stakes are even higher. There is a strong analogy between tobacco and health on the one hand and fossil fuels and climate change on the other. As the IPCC's fifth assessment report confirms, there is no safe way of emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Given the current levels of atmospheric carbon and the many climatic feedback mechanisms, climate science tells us that we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground and we need to reduce global emissions. Climate change is destroying and will continue to destroy lives and livelihoods on an enormous scale. The interests of fossil fuel co corporations and other big polluters directly conflict with the goals of climate change policymakers and the interests of people around the world. And the result of this, vital progress in the climate talks is weakened and blocked. As Naomi Klein argues in This Changes Everything, we must embrace radical change and boldly rein in corporate power if we are going to find real solutions to the climate crisis on the local, national, and international levels. So, what are we going to do? Well, no doubt this year's climate talks in Paris will be just as vulnerable to corporate capture, but there will be an even larger group of people determined to safeguard the negotiations from big energy with the precedent of Article 5.3 of the Global Tobacco Treaty as a powerful tool at their disposal. Learning from the success of the FCTC, we know what this is going to take. It will require a strong coalition of South-North civil society groups supporting and organizing courageous government leaders. It will require global grassroots mobilization and widespread visibility to build the political will. And it will require making strategic decisions to advance the right policies at the right time and being extremely vigilant to the threat of watered down alternatives advanced by the fossil fuel interests. So after all of this, I imagine you're asking yourselves, what can you do today? What can you do in the very near term? Well, the first thing you can do is join the global campaign to keep big energy out of the climate talks. And you can do this by adding your name to Corporate Accountability International's petition and to the 15,000 people whose names have already signed, who, who have already signed on to this petition. The petition can be found at our table, which is outside. My colleague Joe, who's standing by the door and waving right now, is manning the table, so he will help you sign the petition. Or you can find it on our website at stopcorporateabuse.org slash climate. The petition calls on UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and UNFCCC Executive Secretary Christina Figueres to take immediate action to address the influence of big energy over climate talks. This, the second thing you can do is you can support a call for governments to take meaningful action in Bonn and in Paris, making use of all available policy mechanisms to include the concept of Article 5.3 to protect the climate treaty from big energy. 
And finally, you can amplify the visibility generated by Corporate Accountability International, by 350.org, and the other organizations in the room and beyond who support the idea that real progress can only happen when big energy's interests are off the table. You can do this using social media as well as traditional media. You can follow us on Twitter at Stop Corp Abuse. But you can also write letters to the editor responding to news that normalizes the involvement of big, of big energy in the climate negotiations. We have history on our side and incredibly high stakes to propel us forward. We have no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamar. Can we uh, start a hashtag, keep the fox out of the hen house? <laughs> Maybe that's too long for Twitter, probably over, over the character limit. Um, that, was really, that was really brilliant. I almost saw sort of the script for Merchants of Doubt part two. Um, and uh, really look forward to helping your cause as we gear up for Paris. Um, before we continue, I just wanted to give a shout out to um, Cecil Corbin Marks, who's here in the audience, um, the uh, director for policy initiatives at We Act for Environmental Justice. Um, you're a hero for all of us, and thank you for all the work that you do. Our next speaker, and it, it's, this is one of my favorites because I've been so intrigued by the German example for many years now. Um, it's uh, Minister Reinhard Krapp, and uh, he is the head of the economic department of the German mission to the United Nations. And as many of you probably know, Germany has been a true climate leader. They launched their so-called Energiewende, which is the German energy transition um, several years ago after Fukushima happened. Um, Germany has for a long time depended on nuclear power, but after that incident, they became committed to phasing out nuclear. That in itself, That in itself was huge, but they wanted to be doubly ambitious. In addition to phasing out nuclear, they wanted to simultaneously adopt one of the most aggressive renewable energy regimes in the world. Um, and so I forget the numbers, but by 2020, you all are contributing many percent below. <laughs> we'll hear more from you. But so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Reinhard Krupp. He is, um, since July 2014, the head of the economic department of the German mission to the UN. His main areas of interest are international environmental policy, sustainable development, and climate policy. Since 1983, he has had postings at the foreign office in Bonn, Berlin, and at German embassies in Ottawa, Cairo, M Moscow, and Sofia. He also has served at permanent missions in the EU, in Brussels, and the UN in New York. Thank you so much, and join me in welcoming Minister Reinhard Krupp. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I'm honored to be here tonight. This area is a specific area. Last year I was at the Climate March and I'm glad today to be today the guest of uh, the New York chapter of 350.org. And uh, it's most interesting also to see this uh, society of ethical culture. I've never seen such a demonstration of 400,000 people uh, last year here. The last big demonstration <laughs> I saw was in the 80s. I was a student uh, and in Bonn took place uh, large demonstrations. Uh, the peace movement was very active at that time. They organized 300,000. So this is a record, 400,000 people. And I know that uh, in other places also uh, many people demonstrated on the initiative of uh, 350.org, so this organization is also well known in Germany. Um, I'm for quite a number of years involved in this, uh, maybe as now I have a blind eye, I, was, I took part in several conferences of the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and uh, I was uh, in Copenhagen, and, and now I see how it uh, evolves, the negotiations, how they evolve uh, 
preparing Paris. Um, I'm not involved in the exact detailed negotiations now because, as you know, it's, it's taking place in this so-called ad hoc working group on the Durban platform in, of, uh, for enhanced action, the so-called ADP. They are taking place in Geneva where they just uh, met and produced a 90-page paper. Now it will be discussed further. We will have more sessions in, in Bonn in uh, August and October. Actually, I'm quite optimistic that this time uh, we might have a more positive result compared to Copenhagen because it's, it depends on, on, on the United States. It depends on, on China and we see a lot of movement. Just today we see some uh, developments here in the United States and I see a lot of internal pressure in China. So the political pressure on the highest level of governments is much different from that what happened in Copenhagen uh, a few years ago. There seems, it's my personal view, maybe I, I'm wrong, but uh, uh, there is a, a political will to achieve a substantial, a substantive result in this ADP. And by the way, one of the co-chairs is uh, an old friend of mine, Daniel Reifsneider. He is really the, one of the ne uh, veteran uh, climate negotiators from Washington. He knows how to bridge uh, the different positions and actually it's a big advantage in these negotiations to have the mother tongue English because sometimes you just, if you have different delegations and different positions, you know the, the, the small detail and just insert as appropriate and then you might bridge the different positions. Um, so. He understands the, the dynamics of the climate negotiations and has an idea how to bridge the different interests. Here in New York, with the United Nations, we have more the political approach. For example, last year was this big climate event of the Secretary General, and, and these, during these days the climate march took place. And uh, the Secretary General has the cloud, this, this convening power to get 120 heads of states in, in one room. So the United Nations here in New York are quite important as a political impetus. It's not about the details of the next climate agreement, but the political approach, uh, the uh, impulse can come from, from New York. And we will have another meeting on 29th of June uh, on the invitation of the so-called PGA, the President of the General Assembly. There will be another high-level event on climate change. And just today we had a discussion with uh, some uh, colleagues uh, United States, France Security Council members, what could the Security Council contribute? And uh, in 2011, Germany was at that time member of the Security Council. We initiated an open debate in the Security Council and got uh, some presidential statement. And we would like to see this again uh, this year, just a short period before the climate uh, conference in Paris takes place. It's not about the details, as I said, but you need this political impulse for uh, negotiators. Um, tja, maybe I should explain a few central elements of our so-called energy, Energiewende, uh, the transition of German energy policy. Um, as you said already, uh, the German government decided uh, to phase out nuclear energy until 2022. It was quite a surprise decision. It has something to do with the political cloud of our Chancellor, Angela Merkel. Uh, sh maybe other chancellors would not have the ability to convince a conservative party to phase out nuclear energy. But she was able. She's a physicist uh, and the daughter of a president pastor. Maybe it helps. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, we will not have any nuclear reactor after 2022. And how is this possible? We are a highly industrialized country. We need energy. Uh, we have a significant uh, economic growth and the energy needs grow. Um, how is this possible? It's only possible to increase significantly energy efficiency, or this is the other side of the coin, a significantly reduced energy consumption per part, the relationship between input and output. And Germany is promoting renewables in order to reduce Germany's energy dependence on fossil fuels. And the energy efficiency is, is not only something for 
uh, industry is uh, it's for different sectors. It's it's being done through a mix of uh, regulations, fiscal incentives. Uh, we just discussed uh, before we started here the different instruments. We have so-called uh, priority access to the grid, and I heard that the state of New York is currently discussing similar things. Um, we have um, feed-in tariffs, which is not, not uh, maybe I, when I come to the negative side of this, it's not cheap. It's six cents per kilowatt hour uh, for the consumer. Um, if we came from Poland or Bulgaria, it, it, it's expensive if you add six cents per kilowatt to your bill. Um, and we have guaranteed prices for producers of renewables. If you are an average citizen living in a small village, if you have some uh, technology on your roof and you produce uh, uh, solar energy, you have a guarantee that this is taken into the grid and you get a guaranteed price. This price is guaranteed for the next 20 years. Um, all economic sectors in Germany have to make a contribution, and this is the energy sector, this is industry, it's also private households. We have new regulations how to insulate houses. It's about improving heating systems, insulation, transport sector, car emissions. It's about agriculture and other emission sources like, like waste. So the climate policy, it's, it's a climate action plan we adopted last year, is a vast variety of different uh, things. Um, but you, you have to do this, otherwise you won't get uh, substantive results. Therefore, we decoupled economic growth from energy consumption and emissions. You have to decouple it, otherwise it's not possible. And the renewables share in electricity production tripled within the last 10 years. Therefore, in the meantime, due to the lessons learned and improvements of of, uh, alternative technology and concrete market developments, wind energy is in Germany now cheaper than conventional generation technologies. It's most... Uh, I would never have thought that this is possible, but technological progress is, is, is really impressing uh, in the solar energy field. The prices of one module has, have so much shrunk uh, that now it's, it's really almost uh, uh, on a break-even point. Uh, we all know, and that is not always sufficient to convince people with more argu arguments. Okay, you can argue, for example, by telling how important it is that we combat climate change in the interest of our own future and the future of our children and grandchildren. And I found it most interesting what uh, our colleague from the Maldives said. You see his emotion behind it. It's, it's really impressive. Um, but people they might approve of this all, but when it gets very concrete, in Germany and the United States, economic principles prevail and will bring the necessary results. And just from an economic point of view, the German energy transition makes sense. It has a number of positive effects. Renewables save Germany billions in import costs for fossil fuels. We are a country not as, as the United States, there's a lot of fossil fuels around, but Germany has now access to many fuel. For, we have coal, but not too much. And the second, the renewable sector is a job motor for Germany. You, I could yet tell you now how many jobs are created, but this is really a job motor. Uh, renewable installations create multiple opportunities for new entrepreneurships. And Germany, this is also very important, it's not uh, only um, cheap prices and important is also the safe procurement of um, uh, energy. Uh, we maintain top security levels despite the energy transition. If you ask the head of one of the big utility companies in Germany, they would always say, ha, this is uh, most uh, dangerous wind is not always blowing, the sun is not always shining. What, is, what do you do when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining? We need a certain Grundlast, we call it in Germany. Basically, we need a certain number of uh, installations uh, which really uh, rely on fossil fuels. Otherwise, you risk an interruption of your supply. Um, in, in our system, as, as you know, Germany is, is part of the European Union. We cannot do 
on a national scale, many things. When it comes to car emissions, you have one, one car emission. You cannot uh, sell a car with a regulation in Germany with this emission standard and uh, in, in France another emission standard. So we rely heavily on what is going on in the European legislation. Um, and the EU environment ministers, I'm glad to say, they decided at their March Council meeting that the European Combustion uh, will be, um, let me see now the numbers, um, the EU will reduce greenhouse gases until 2030 by at least 40 percent compared to 1990. I uh, might add, it's a bubble, it's, it's all, all EU. Germany has to do more because we have a very heterogeneous European Union. Countries like Poland cannot do the same because they heavily rely on, on coal and they cannot change it from one year to another. Therefore, we in Germany will uh, reduce uh, by 40% uh, until 2020. EU until 2030, Germany until 2020. Therefore, these, uh, what you talked about, the intended nationally determined contribution, the famous INDCs, this is the European contribution and the German contribution. So, let me conclude. I see I have one minute left. Uh, our national goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990, this, because this is the framework of the UN C uh, based on 1990, whereas the American numbers are on 2005. Um, but it's a mathematical question how you compare this. Um, 40% until 2050, and uh, we will reduce CO2 emissions by 55% until 2030. 70% until 2040, 80 to 95% by 2050. If you tell these, this to people in Germany, they don't believe it, really, because they say, how can you change this 80%? But the technological progress is amazing. You really can do, you can run an industry, an industrialized country like Germany with a very small part of uh, fossil fuel. Uh, this is possible today in absolute numbers. We had 1,250 million tons CO2 equivalents in 1990, and now we want to have less than 250 million tons. It's quite significant still, I confess, but it's, it's a significant reduction. And it's not because uh, Germany uh, is so, so, so <laughs> tall, we would say, in Germany. Uh, now it has something to the People in Germany, we are uh, geographically very central uh, in, in Europe in the midst. Therefore, we have already for 40, 50 years uh, the problem of, of emissions. Acid rain was a problem already during the 70s. It came from Canada, that it was first mentioned. Uh, therefore, the, the public, the general public in Germany thinks green. Either you come from the left or from the right or whatnot, or from the liberal side, you would not dare as a politician to be against. Uh, some ecological things. Otherwise, you would just be thrown away. You would not get any votes. It's, it's very deep in, in the German, sorry, the, uh, I don't know, the yeah, der Deutsche Wald, it, it sounds a bit peculiar, who speaks German, but the forest, for example, it has some, some meaning for, for many Germans. Therefore, this ecological movement in Germany is not just from, from, from heaven. It, it's, it's a development about uh, decades. So, we have an ambitious and, uh, agenda which is not easy to achieve. Uh, and it's not just the goal of some idealistic environmentalists, it's, it's, it's tough, it's, it's economy. And uh, the content of our National Climate Action Program, approved by the Chancellor and her Cabinet, will be implemented for sure. So, improving energy efficiency, switching to renewables are gaining momentum in Germany. And this will help to achieve our ambitious goals they are necessary if we want to keep global warming below 2 centigrades <laughs> or 1.5. 1.5, actually, I must confess, is very ambitious. Uh, and I'm not sure that we will get the 2 uh, centigrades. But uh, we need to uh, keep global warming below 2 centigrades compared to pre-industrial times. Thank you. So I don't know if you noticed, but um, Minister Krupp actually said something completely earth-shattering. Um, he said a couple of things that were earth-shattering, but the one that I'm going to mention is that Germany is decoupling prosperity from carbon. 
It's decoupling energy from growth. We have always seen those go in lockstep. We have fossil fuel development, countries booming, bustling industrial revolution, growth. But for the first time, and if we're going to survive, we have to separate our prosperity from are putting out of carbon emissions, and, and Germany is able to achieve that, and it's just stunning. Um, I always hold them up as the example when conservatives in this country mention that acting on climate is too expensive, because the last time I checked, Germany's lights were still on. So I wanted to mention, we're going to have questions um, shortly after our, our next and last speaker, so please, some index cards have been passed around, write your questions down, we'll be happy to take them. So our final speaker, and I'm so glad she was able to make it, um, is Council Member Helen Rosenthal of the New York City Council. She represents District 6 and is the chair of the Committee on Contracts. Um, Helen Rosenthal is absolutely um, a dear and uh, close friend of 350 NYC. She has done amazing work on behalf of environmental justice initiatives. She has co-sponsored legislation that would aim to reduce New York City's carbon emissions 80% by 2050, which is essential to keeping the United States as a whole on track um, on the president's climate commitments. She's also sponsored the latest um, no idling laws that you may have heard about on the news. Um, she is actually working to stop those taxis, those trucks that you see outside of their delivery spot from sitting there for five, six minutes just spewing carbon into the atmosphere. And she's done it in such a brilliant way because it gives incentives to people like you and me to videotape these violations, send them in, and you get half of the fine. How cool is that? Um, I had the honor of speaking with her on Global Divestment Day at a rally in the financial district. She's an amazing woman, super, super smart and sparky. Please welcome Council Member Helen Rosenthal. Um, wow, it's so nice to be here. Uh, and uh, it's, I just feel like um, I'm going to be such a Debbie Downer after hearing the German minister talking about all these achievements in Germany. Um, so we're going to get down to brass tacks about reality in New York City, and that's what I've been charged to do here. Um, of course, I want to thank 350.org for not only, and I'm looking at you, Lisa, not only training and nurturing me, but for hosting and organizing this incredibly important event. Um, and I'm honored to be here speaking with such distinguished uh, other colleagues and also with you in the audience, many of whom I recognize and very much appreciate as excellent advocates here on the Upper West Side. We're in my district, so I'm very proud to have you here. So um, I'd like to talk about uh, <laughs> the reality of getting uh, pro-environment bills through the New York City Council and passed into law. Um, you know, when I thought about running for office, I knew that I could never do what you all do. I can't do federal stuff or state stuff. I just don't get it. But I totally get trying to fix the pothole on the corner of 70th and Amsterdam which I've been able to do. So let's start with um, fossil fuel divestment, a really big one and a great one, right? So I have legislation that would require the city controller to do a fiscal impact study of divesting from the top 200 fossil fuel companies in our, city, in our city's pension funds um, that we currently invest in, right? This is... Um, Okay, I need to bottle what you just did, because let me tell you what happened. I wrote this, I, I had the lawyers, the legal staff in the city council write this legislation. It's great legislation. We find, found a little loophole where the city council could actually require the controller to do this study. It's just a study, right? It's a study. I'm not, I've learned my lesson. I'm not asking to divest. And, uh, and 
about 10 or 15 members of the city council. I'm a member of the Progressive Caucus. I introduced it to the Progressive Caucus. Everyone's very excited. Again, everyone signs on. Everyone's really excited. We're going to introduce it at the next stated meeting, which is how you introduce legislation to be considered. And literally, the day before the bill was going to be introduced, five of the co-sponsored called me up and said, Helen, I'm going to have to get off your bill. I'm like, okay, you need political cover, whatever. And then by the end of the day, everyone had gotten off the bill. And I was threatened that if I move this forward, not from the speaker's office, I have to say, not from the speaker's office. This speaker is phenomenal, and she is all about the democratic process. You want to introduce a bill and try to get it through the council, you go for it. But I was threatened that somebody would embarrass her for my introducing it into the council. And I'm very close with this speaker. I support her, and I would never want that to happen, and I pulled the legislation. So it's sitting in my desk. And um, should I be embarrassed or what to say that out loud? But I'm saying it out loud. That's what happened. And uh, Lisa and I have a meeting coming up. I know I keep postponing it, but we are going to have it, where we're going to come up with a new strategy of how we're going to bottle the energy you just had, the applause that you just had, and help direct it in a way so that we can help get the question out there of what is the most effective way to help us get to an 80% reduction by 2050, and what are the city and the state controller doing to get us there? Is there action, which is uh, shareholder activism, and you can go on their websites and see what they do, it, it looks great. Is that step gonna help us get to 80% uh, reduction by 2050, or, do we need to do a study to look at divesting from fossil fuels, instead using that money to invest in renewables so we can do what Germany's doing, where you know it's cheaper to have wind energy, that is just phenomenal to me, than to have traditional energy. Let me tell you about a few other bills that I'm working on. Um, so, so Bill de Blasio passed his 80 by 50, which is just tremendous. Uh, President Obama just signed a reduction of 40% of uh, energy and to use renewable energies, uh, an increase by 30% within the next decade. Very terrific, great step. So we've introduced bills um, to put solar panels on the top of all city buildings. We've introduced bills to look at geothermal energy, to look at greater use of insulation, to, um, let's see, invest in renewables and biodiesel vehicles, to only use, I'm chair of the contracts committee, you'd think I could work on this one, to only use, um, uh, have procurement, with a focus on renewables, um, we're, we're in fact going to need to do all these very practical things before um, we'll be able to get to 2050. So where are we on all of these bills, right? They're all great. I would guess there are at least 30 that have been introduced into the city council. So none of them have had a first hearing in a committee. And as you might know, the way a bill becomes law is it gets introduced into the city council, and then you have a first hearing. You might have negotiations with the administration. You hear from advocates. You hear from opponents. You have a second hearing, a vote, and then you have a vote um, on the floor of the city council. And then it goes to the mayor to sign. We haven't even gotten to, I guess, second base, right? Because most of these bills have been introduced, but we haven't been able to get them to get heard. 
in committee. I'm very proud to have introduced a resolution to uh, call New York City a TPP. I'm a Debbie Downer tonight, aren't I? I'm really sorry. We're going to move. We're going to get positive in one second. I don't know when, but we will. Um, to introduce New York City as a TPP free zone and encourage Congress not to grant President Obama fast track authority or permission to sign TPP. I'm really proud of that one. Um, and, you know, if you think about, um, uh, you know, our, our larger environmental responsibilities, government responsibilities, you have to th also have to think about our individual responsibilities. So I've introduced a bill called Meatless Mondays, where, uh, you know, if we just, it turns out that um, if you reduce the use, uh, the consumption of meat by 15 percent, it'll have a serious impact on reducing carbon emissions and improve heart healthiness as well, right? So one day a week, Meatless Mondays. Haven't gotten a first hearing on that one. Um, I uh, introduced last year, actually I wasn't allowed, to, another one I wasn't allowed to introduce. Um, and, and this goes to the future of our city. Um, and that is Student Voter Registration Day to try to get the next generation active and engaged. And I'm wearing my button because we had a kickoff today for Student Voter Registration Day. Last year, I tried to introduce a resolution that would call on the chancellor, the, the Department of Education, the chancellor for the city schools, to um, require every school, high school, to have a Student Voter Registration Day where they would integrate into the curriculum, the notion of why it's not just important to register to vote, but actually the value of voting and how you know your voice could make all the difference in what our climate change legislation is. Um, but I was given a good, no one's tweeting, are they? No? Okay. Um, I was given a good talking to, and, uh, and I, I I, okay, so we don't want to move too quick here. So uh, what I agreed to do was do a pilot study with my colleagues. So tomorrow, 15 council members will work with um, advocates like New York City Votes, Rock the Vote, Turbo Vote, the New York, uh, the League of Women Voters, um, let's see, Citizens Union, Common Cause, Citizens Action, all of whom will help and go into 25 different high schools and help to have a student voter registration day where they will lay out a curriculum for the teachers and they will be going into classrooms and actually encouraging students to register to vote and then for the value of voting, you know, to go out and vote next year's a, a presidential. That could be very exciting year after is a presidential. So that would be really exciting. Um, so what I, <laughs> so the carrot before me was, you go out, Helen, and make a pilot and make it work. And we will consider requiring high schools to have a curriculum to teach students the importance of, of, of voting. Do you know that every year, the Department of Education sends out 80,000 voter registration cards with each diploma it sends to students? 80,000. So given the number of, of people between the ages of 15 and 30 who register to vote, we know the numbers, and given the percentage of those who vote, right, 3% of men, 5% of women. Um, I, I'm just hoping that those cards at least go into recycling, you know? <laughs> That's part of my hope there. Um, lastly, I want to talk about my idling bill. Um, so earlier this month, as you mentioned, uh, you know, I, I introduced a bill that would get to the enforcement problems um, that surround New York City's excellent anti-idling laws. Um, and they were strengthened, I'm time out? Soon, okay. 
time. Okay, this will be fast. So um, we have great idling laws in the book, and, and Bloomberg, a great advocate, right? So he made the idling laws even stricter, right? So you cannot idle for more than 30 minutes in your curbside, curbside with your car. Sorry, for more than three minutes curbside. Sorry, out in the streets. So many numbers running around in my head. So, um, and if you're in front of a school, you cannot idle for more than a minute. Wow. How many um, tickets do you think were written last year? Close, 207. <laughs> so about 10 years ago, uh, the city was very serious about this and uh, trained and will allow traffic, a uh, traffic agents, you know, the, um, the ones that give parking tickets, train them to do the, you know, enforce the anti-idling laws. So there were like 1,000 tickets written that year. So um, this, the bill that I've introduced would um, ask the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, to train ordinary citizens to learn how to responsibly, re very responsibly, very respectfully learn how to videotape a car, not the person, and not getting in any fight, but just videotape perhaps the license and the emission coming out of the tailpipe. Uh, for a minute or three minutes, show where they are, and then upload it onto the website. And we do have uh, laws on the books that allow for um, citizens to share in the revenue for the ticket. Um, this wouldn't be something that's anonymous, actually. If a ticket was going to be issued, people would have to come and testify in front of an administrative judge, but they could collect um, half the revenue. I'm really hoping that bill, which, you know, as a new council member, I'm just sort of learning about press, that got me the most press hits. So that was really exciting. So no first hearing has been scheduled, but I'm really hoping that'll be heard in September. So um, look, I, I, you know, you mentioned so uh, well that we have to give our electeds the political will to do these things, right? We can have a law, and Bill de Blasio signed this law that we have to reduce our carbon emissions in New York City by 80% by the year 2050. But if we don't have a real roadmap, if we don't have a real strategic plan, if we're not passing bills that get us geothermal energy today and, and have us look at divesting today. And if we're not putting up white roofs, solar panels, wind, uh, you know, wind energy, I don't see how we're going to get there. And what we need is your energy. We need your support. I need you to help me give the other politicians the political will to have a hearing, to pass these pieces of legislation, and get them signed into law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Helen Rosenthal. All right, it's, um, thank you so much for your patience and sticking around. I know it's a long program, but um, I've been riveted by the speakers. I hope you have been too. So we're gonna kick off our Q&A now. And uh, the first question is actually for Helen. Sorry, I should really be more formal. For Council Member Rosenthal. Um, what happened to get everyone to drop off that um, first bill that you mentioned? What happened to make those five co-sponsors of the energy legislation, was it di the, the legislation to study divestment, what caused them to one by one back out? What pressure was brought to bear? I'm, I, it would be inappropriate. Oh, look, a call. I have to take <laughs> um, Speak into the, okay, next question. We won't put you on the spot. I don't, it's not appropriate for me to talk about it. You know, the electives, the other electives, I'm happy to introduce this bill. Um, 
my colleagues got pressured to get off the bill. I didn't get any phone calls. I have no idea. I got no phone calls. And uh, I haven't been able to get any meetings either. So. Well, that concerns all of us. And it's, it's ironic that you're talking about voting and the, uh, you know, luxury and importance of voting and yet we voted for you we voted to have you elected yet your bills are being stymied at every turn that doesn't seem fair um, okay this question is maybe for the whole panel but perhaps most for um sean and uh reinhardt how much do the troika and austerity policies in europe frustrate climate objectives i'm familiar with the austerity i'm not actually familiar with troika but perhaps you guys are how much do the austerity policies in Europe frustrate climate objectives? This, this mission to really cut down the budget and uh, rein in economic spending. Oh, I'm sorry, say it one more time. And we're all paying attention. <laughs> this is perhaps more for the, for the European, but, but so how much do the austerity policies, austerity policies in Europe frustrate climate objectives? Can you speak into the microphone? Everybody, please do hold the microphone. It's, it's hard to hear otherwise. Um, it's a pertinent question. It's, Germany is severely criticized at the moment, also by some uh, famous uh, American economists. Paul Krugman. Uh, for, its, uh, for Krugman uh, for its austerity policy. Um, yeah. It's difficult to answer this question. Um, Maybe just explain what austerity means to the audience that may not be aware. I think the result of climate policy, I have never thought about it, because this is, uh, this is austerity means we are very reluctant to have a big deficit. Uh, it's difficult to see the direct connection to, to climate change. Our policy will not be uh, changed by, by our Austerity, austerity policy. There is a long tradition in Germany. We had two big inflations after World War Two, after uh, after World War One, and it's it's deep rooted in the German soul that uh, inflation is something bad, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore Chancellor Merkel will certainly get the support of the majority of Germans uh, to continue her austerity policy. Uh, but now we are in the eurozone. Germany is has many advantages through the Euro and Southern Europe has its problems because we have a, we have a certain growth and uh, the, the Euro is, is not strong. When I came last year, it was 140 mm -hmm. to a dollar. Uh, now I get one dollar and six cents, mm -hmm. most unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, for German exporters, it's very uh, good. And the tax, we have, we have never had uh, such a good budget. We have no budget deficit at all at the moment. No. Uh, the result is we can afford uh, a quite ambitious climate policy. It, it's not easy for countries like Greece uh, to do such an ambitious policy. Uh, we can afford, and German citizens can afford, because the in income is good, to pay uh, a huge chunk of subsidy to renewable energies. As I said, uh, six cents per uh, Kilowatt hour, it's not possible to pay for a Greek who has an income of 300 euros or so, mm -hmm. uh, or 300 dollars. The average income in Germany is much bigger. Therefore, our austerity policy is to our advantage and makes possible our ambitious climate policy. Thank you. I think the argument um, is that because of the tight rein on, on spending and the unwillingness to spend, some economists like Krugman suggest that we're unable to invest in the future. We're unable to build the infrastructure, the renewable energy investments that we need. And like you mentioned, Germany is in a great position because of your wealth to not have to choose. But here in the US, our conservatives are so obsessed with keeping the budget constrained that we're not able to spend money on things that we need, especially clean energy investments and inf basic infrastructure like new roads and public transit. Yes. Budget deficit financing Okay. 
I don't know who asked this question, but it's a very important one. Does anybody Mike. want to identify it? Thank you. Thank you for asking the question. Mike. Can you hear me now? Thank you for the question. The way I see it, the Troika enforced, enforced privatization on Greece, for example. And privatization, the so-called competitive internal market for electricity, is a big part of the EU agenda. And Germany, I think, is an interesting case because part of the, I think, the liftoff of renewables in Germany, at least in my understanding, and I can obviously defer to our colleague here, is the remunicipalization of certain functions of the energy system, of the democratic retaking of electricity, particularly at the procurement level and the grids. And you've seen a number of cities, 30, 40, 50 cities, take back uh, through municipal power their electric electricity system. It's a partial step, but it's very important that the, it really was a pushback against the neoliberal privatization policies around electricity. Now, if we look at Greece, first of all, what, what, renewable, what privatization does is it makes renewable energy unpopular. We've seen this in Denmark, which also had 20% plus renewable power. When it was public, people saw a windmill like they saw a school, like they saw a hospital. Mm. It's, we, it belongs to the people, the people paid for it. Start to privatize it, nobody wants a wind turbine across the street that's owned by a landowner that is making personal profit out of it. The resistance to renewables then goes up. So then what happens is Denmark then goes offshore with its renewable power, which is far more expensive in the case of offshore wind. So the privatization actually is an impediment, I think, to uh, an obstacle to the spread of renewables. My last point on this, on Greece. The interesting thing about Syriza, the new government, is the first day after they were elected, they canceled the privatization of the Public Power Corporation. And they're calling for a new economic and ecological paradigm. Now, it's all at the level of political program at this point. The policies need to be put in place. But look what they can do with 300 days of sunshine every year. Mm -hmm. They have minimal solar generation, they have solar thermal. They could actually drive in the public sector a transition over 10, 15, 20 years that could make Greece completely, 100%, based on renewable power. They have to phase out lignite mining because they're heavily dependent on domestic lignite and imported gas. Greece has the highest per capita emissions in the European Union. Mm. So I see the opportunity in Greece as very, very significant to drive um, a, a real climate protection agenda that ramps up uh, renewable power. My last point is this, I think Germany should be applauded for its accomplishments, Denmark also. And for the way the people, the green movement, the, and to some extent the labor movement, very supportive of it as well, have got behind uh, this transition. But they really are, those countries I think are somewhat of an exception when you look across Europe. The UK, other countries are way, way behind in renewable mm -hmm. power, precisely because of austerity and privatization measures. Thank you. So we're going to go with a slightly more lighthearted question this time. It's not lighthearted for the person who asked it, however. As a young, ad young adult aspiring to work in this field with no previous related work experience, where do you recommend I begin? And then in parentheses she writes, looking beyond volunteer work, P.S. a girl's got to eat. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow, do you mind taking that? <laughs> Mike. If you're an organizer and you're interested in... <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. There we go. If you're an organizer and you're interested in mobilizing people to take on this call to action, then you should start at Corporate Accountability International. Um, <laughs> but beyond that, I'd love to open it up to others if they, if they have any advice. I think building this movement of allies is really going to be what carries us forward. Um, anybody else? Well, can I just, is this working? Okay. Can I just say to the young person who's asking uh, that my daughter, my 21 year old daughter is such a young person and has been looking and it's hard and it's hard to find something that 
Um, a girl's got to eat. It's hard to find something that pays well. You know, if you're an organizer, there are actually lots of grassroots, grassroots organizing groups out there that are looking for young people, and I could give you a list of the ones that my daughter applied to. She actually ended up taking an interesting route. She's going to be, um, don't tell her I said this, but anyway, she's going to, um, she's going to literally go in sales. So she's joining a solar panel sales company in Boston and will be part of a team of people that goes out to people's homes and tries to sell solar panels and other sorts of uh, energy sustainability measures. So there are lots of ways to go. I'd urge you to think outside of the box. Thank you. So this next question is, well, this next question is for Tamar. Uh, can we decouple the fossil fuel industry from the politicians to whom they give money? Sorry. And anyone is obviously welcome to answer <laughs> as well. Question. Um, no. I, th <laughs> I think is the short answer. Um, the language of Article 5.3 says it pretty well. I think it's the tobacco industry or the fossil fuel industry and those representing their interests. Um, corporate Accountability International, for example, is, we call ourselves a member-powered organization. What that means is our funding comes from individual members like you and I. Um, we don't take any corporate money, we don't even take any government money, and that's what gives us the political independence to be able to pursue policies and organize around things that matter to individual people. So. No. I mean, one thing I would say in New York City, we have wonderful campaign finance laws. Um, and, you know, there is a big movement to get campaign finance in, in Albany. Um, this is one of the reasons for it. Campaign finance reform, indeed. This question is for Reinhardt. What are the most important technological advancements enabling Germany's transition? You mentioned wind. What are the other big ones? It's, it's a whole range, it's not just one, one thing. Very important, for example, in Germany and in Europe is the system cap and trade. I am I'm strongly convinced that regulations sometimes are not as efficient as, uh, as economic means. Mm. If you just have a cap and under this you can trade the emissions. And I think this is also being done in New York now. It seems a very good instrument, and this works in Germany. It could work better because we inflated the number of emission certificates uh, under this cap. Therefore, the price of the emission uh, certificates is, is, is almost nothing. It's three dollars. It used to be thirty dollars. But if you have this system functioning, and you you can somehow govern what the total uh, em uh, of the emissions is, then it's just economic. It's economics. You can, can emit as much as you want, but you have to pay. For every ton of CO2, you have to, to buy a certificate. And I think it's, it's, it's marvelous. And we need a price, a world price for carbon emissions. Then you can say, okay, it costs $30 per ton. Okay, you can emit as much as you will, but you have to pay. And for sure, companies will then think of how to get their energy policy more efficient or how to, uh, to improve the system as such. Speaking of a carbon price, I wanted to give a shout out to Joseph Robertson, who's here in the audience. Uh, he's um, uh, a leader of Citizens Climate Lobby who I'm sure many of you know about. Um, if you don't, they are a fully grassroots organization that lobbies their members of Congress, depending on which state or city they live in, um, to put a price on carbon. And they're making amazing headway. Um, they've met with every member of Congress multiple times by now, even the hardcore Republicans and conservatives, and um, they're really doing the Lord's work in educating them about the benefits, because at the end of the day, if they have to choose between EPA hard, you know, hard hitting regulation, draconian top down versus a market price, the choice is obvious. So um, 
please, if you haven't already, check out Citizens Climate Lobby and, and go to their website. Um, they're also doing an initiative called Pathway to Paris, um, which is a worth, worth a look as well. Sean, this is for you. What are the labor fights happening in Paris, France this year, and will these local fights be lifted up by labor at the COP? I don't know. Um, I, I know across Europe the anti-austerity agenda, what's going to play out in the COP, I think, or what around the COP, is that if unions try to organize around climate in the abstract, they're not going to get, um, they're not going to get people moving. But if they connect it to the real attacks on workers' rights across Europe, the end of social Europe should have been announced a long time ago. It's uh, with one or two countries exception, there is a tremendous uh, erosion of uh, protections for workers. Um, and I think that the connection of workers and the climate is gonna be absolutely important. So I think the COP potentially could be bigger than New York if it manages to connect workers' interests with the interests of the climate. We have to protect both people and the planet and a new agenda, anti-austerity agenda has to be part of that in my view. Thank you. This is a really, this is an important question. Um, as someone that works in climate communications, this starts to hit the nail on the head. In our time, it is understood that tobacco threatens human health. Why haven't asthma and upper respiratory illnesses and other human health threats related to changes in the climate been enough for people to see the dangers? I mean, I, I think the... the or maybe, maybe more so, what can we do to, to make those connections and connect the dots for yeah. people? agenda is largely being written by the industry and the, the, the you know what's being talked about is dictated by what, where the industry draws puts the emphasis um, I think it's up to organizations like ours and people like us to really build those connections to expose the influence of the industry and to use the visibility that we generate around those those abuses to challenge the industry and the rhetoric and the you know the, the the falsehoods mm -hmm. that are out there. I mean, I think you said it earlier that it, it, in 2015, it's ridiculous that there is any, any question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, I'll urge everyone to go check out Merchants of Doubt, um, the amazing film about Naomi Oreskes' book by the same name. Uh, it really just shows the systematic, decades-long misinformation, disinformation campaign by the t tobacco lobbyists who are now in service, working in service to the climate uh, fossil fuel lobby uh, companies as well. I sort of think the answer to that question is the um, question that was asked, I think it was two questions ago, about uh, campaign financing. I think that's kind of the answer. Thank you. We have a question from the floor. <laughs> this is for Reinhardt. Tell us a little bit about uh, how, how do the German people, you mentioned they have this deep environmental ethos that's built into their psyche. How is it um, that they relate to corporations? Is there this sense um, that we've been discussing here that corporations capture the political process in Germany? Well, as in other countries, we have leftists, we have people from the right. The notion of cooperation is not negative in, in Germany. Uh, maybe things have changed. It's somehow neutral. I, I, I don't know. Cooperation is it's, it's a company. Uh, and why should it be negative? Uh, we are aware that uh, the decisions often are made by some boards of directors, particularly in the energy field, mm -hmm. and we have to be very careful that yeah. this big power of uh, companies, and we have quite a centralized system, we have four utility companies and they decide a lot, um, that they don't influence politics too much. Okay, their arguments are heard, but uh, we have quite a multifaceted political system, therefore maybe it was worse two, three decades ago. Mm -hmm. Our 
multinational utilities companies are quite in the defensive. Companies like RWE uh, or E.ON, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they have really difficulties nowadays because they, they slept when the revolution of the renewables started. They just built power plants with fossil fuels. How can you build nowadays a fossil fuel plants? It's economic, it's, it's wrong economics. Mm -hmm. And now they are in the defensive and I think uh, they have to, to over, to, to, to renew their policy. My own daughter is uh, at the EMB in Stuttgart. Uh, <laughs> it's really difficult for them to survive because now the renewables revolution is a very, is, it's, it's a medium sized, it's very decentralized. Everybody can contribute, you have your own uh, panels on your roof and the big companies, the corporations, hmm, they have to see how to survive. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I understand that E.ON, Germany's biggest utility, has actually just spun out its fossil fuel business and is now looking to, you know, uh, diversify and that's the thing that frustrates me and I think many observers is that the fossil fuel companies could own the clean energy future if they wanted to. They have the wealth, they've got the means. It's just a matter of guts. Anyway, we're, um, we're about to end and I wanted to give our panelists an, uh, an opportunity to conclude with some very brief remarks. Um, I just want to give everybody, first of all, my deepest appreciation and thanks for being here. Um, it really was a great service and you've inspired all of us. And what a diversity of, of voices we heard, international, global, all the way down to the, the city level. Um, so thank you everybody uh, for being here. And if we could just go down briefly, any closing remarks you'd like to leave uh, with the audience? Help me. <laughs> wanted to say I'm very impressed that we had here tonight uh, more than 200 people who are really uh, you see the they're engaged and stay engaged thank you don't forget to sign the petition on your way out thank you. <laughs> Just, thanks for coming thanks for your questions and it's really enjoyed it and the organizers always do a great job at 350 NYC so and, and just I've always enjoyed coming whether I'm in the audience or up here I enjoy it immensely thank you <laughs>